Good morning, everyone. Welcome to my video. So, drum roll, volume six. The Roxy Girls have unleashed volume six field notes. So, with much anticipation, I am about to go through my ideas, uh, formulate a bit of a plan of attack, give myself some homework to create the journals, and then I think in the next video, I should have my bases ready and start thinking about title page. Oh, so much to do. So firstly, back it up. Let's just start at the beginning. I'm going to be doing two. I was sort of torn and I couldn't decide. I'm doing one that is based on my new natural environment that I'm living in. So that is uh, my backyard through to a saltwater lake, through to an estuary, mangrove area, sand dunes, beach, and into the ocean. So just something brand new for me to explore. That's going to be this journal. So I'll just pop that to one side and that's going to be a concertina. But first, let's get Edith out of the system. This is why I was so torn. I love Edith Holden. I, oh, I just think she was just the most talented lady. So I grabbed out some books that I haven't seen anyone pop up on video yet. If you have seen these already, um, I do apologize. I'll show you this fabric in a moment that might send us off on another tangent. Um, this one here, I picked up ages ago. When I was doing journals, I was doing Edith Holden inspired pieces and mucking around with all sorts of things. And I came across this craft book, all based on Edith Holden's design. So in here are cross stitches, through to tops and you know like little images in um, crocheted into tops that's knitted knitted into tops so I thought there might be something in here like potentially doing a cross stitch uh, look at that into a journal I thought wow that'd be super cool to revisit some of those old techniques and I've got some patterns so that's what sort of made me think I need to do two so there is potential in here for something. Gosh, what is that? The blackberry, oh, the blackberries. Which sort of made me think about old techniques that I grew up doing. And cross stitch was one, embroidering doilies was another. And that sort of framed my, um, my piece, if you will, what my project is gonna be loosely based around, of course, under the umbrella of Edith. If you get a chance to get your hands on this, this is her actual story about her as a young woman traipsing through the countryside, collecting and recording history, plus her family. So it's a really great read. I, I just absolutely adored going through this. So if you do see it online and you'd like to just have it in your library, grab it. Her death was tragic, you know, doing what she loved. She drowned, reaching out into the river to grab a sample to sketch. Like, just amazing. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, getting all nostalgic. So you've all seen all of the other Edith books. There's colouring in books, there's um, poetry books, then heaps of these that have been printed over the years. This one here... This fell out of my shelf. I was sitting with my Edith books and I thought, yeah, that's, a, that's another classic Edith imagery. And look at all the sketching in the background. And I thought, well, you know, that's not a bad way of creating yourself a background. And then your floral goes from there, is sketch in some simple lines to sort of take you to a place where Edith may have been. I love that, the black sketching and then the artwork on top so I thought I'll just show you that book because it certainly resonated with me Gosh, imagine being able to draw that we need Lulu to draw all that and then we could just cut it out and stick it in there you go Rachel get Lulu making some designs for your fabrics the inspiring little architect coming along that'd be just awesome look at this so this this line drawing business. So that's sort of where I'm heading with this. We've got traditional crafts. I've forgotten to bring something to the table. So hold that position. 
Okay, so we've got traditional techniques of embroidery that you could imagine would be back when Edith was a girl. And she would have been sitting around stitching if she wasn't drawing. I'd be pretty confident. That's what they all did. I thought, well, I'm going to dig out all of my unfinished doilies. So I've got a, a small selection. I have gone shopping and ordered a few more. So there's parcels coming from all over the place. What I plan to do is my pages are going to be a background that's neutral, collaged with morsels from unfinished embroideries. So that's going to give me the line drawing effect in the distance of my background, okay? I found this piece as well. And when I was thinking concertina, I was like, how am I gonna make this work as a concertina? It's very big. I didn't wanna lose any of that beautiful imagery. So I sort of put it away. And then, I, I don't know, it, take, it pays for me just to have a few days to ponder and think a project through. So I've got three gorgeous images here, but I think I can make it work. So let's just wind back a little bit and I'll show you where I'm heading even more. So we've got, let me grab a few things and we'll pop that book out of the way. So in my stash that will sit with the project, I'll have this book, which gives me cross stitch inspiration. I've also got then my unfinished doily inspiration. I like the idea of sketching. We'll all be doing a little bit of that, I think. So that's definitely part of it. Now, as for the actual book, now, when I was doing journaling, I was nibbling into one of the books and I remembered that I had one that had partial pages used. So I come running in here this morning thinking I would have a cover here. I don't. I was so disappointed. I thought, oh, if only I could use the cover, but it's long gone. I've turned it into a journal. So this book will be hanging around as well because if I want to cut anything out or do something a little bit off fabric and collage -y with paper, I've got something that I can nibble into. So I was pleased about that. But then I was like, where's my cover? I need a cover. So this cover here is going to be my cover. So I'm going to sacrifice another book. I've got two of this one. So I thought for the good of the, good of the um, sanity of the girl, we're just going to do it. I love the spine. Yeah, it's, it's just beautiful. It's probably not wide enough to do what I want to do, but I'll deal with that when we need to deal with that. So at this stage, this is my cover, unless I have a better idea, but that's my cover. And if it gets to the point where I, I'm all shaky and I just can't break into this book, we might come up with something else. Yeah, you know, maybe I can use, reinforce something here. Yeah, let's do that. I can't cut a book. That took, what, three years to cut into that one. No, put the book away. We don't need the book. Don't need the book. All we need is some pages. Reinforce them. Slush a bit of fabric around. And we can create a cover. So that's where I'm at with that now. Okay, we've made a decision. That's my donor book. We've got our inspiration. Um, now, as you've seen with the girls' videos, I've got these gorgeous fabrics from Rachel as well. So, oh, they're gorgeous, guys. If you're patiently waiting to get your order fulfilled or you're considering it or you don't know what the hang I'm talking about, head on over to Rachel's Etsy store and have a little look. I bet she's been slammed, so just be patient. You know, it's I, I can feel her pain. It just takes time to get printers, to get stock back to you. You know, the world moves quite slow when you're in a hurry. So just be patient, but it certainly is a treasure trove of goodies that could be used in your pieces. Now, I've unpacked all of my little parcels, so there, and I've looked through them like 20 million times. There's morsels of script, morsels of artwork, um, birds, butterflies, like... I won't go through every piece because you'll end up seeing something and you'll think it's connected to the piece below, but it's probably not. It's been 
rummage through by myself looking at designs. So I will be nibbling into this a little bit. And then having said that, I might not because it's like I might have to go into Hordesville and I might just need to look at it for a little while, maybe a couple of years before I touch it. Isn't it just silly? So I just wanted to say they are available to me to play with, but I don't know if I'm ready to play with them, if that makes sense. I know it makes sense to you guys. You know what I'm thinking. There's also pages here. Absolutely beautiful. Oh, like isn't that just waiting to have a, an image put into that frame? Oh, love, love, love it. Love the colours, Rachel. Oh, but I just don't know if I can use them. <laughs> Goodness me. Might be a project another day. Oh, gorgeous. Okay, put them away. I can't, can't use them just yet. Maybe I'll go nibbling later in the volume. But at the moment, I think I've got enough. I think I've got enough. And I guess with the Edith concept that I'm thinking about, I don't think they fit, but I'm not sure yet. If anything, what would fit is text. But I've got stamps, I've got scrap linen, like I can create this myself too. I can embroider and then I can save these morsels. So that's that's just so silly. That's where my head's at at the moment. But it's sitting to one side. The girls are using these continuous pieces on their journals, which will be fun to watch them evolve. Now I've unwrapped it and popped that away. So they're there if we want them. But what I've also found... When I was with Susanna, the week prior to her getting here, the Tilda, the new Tilda range came out. So Dewdrop in um, Dewdrop in in Harvey Bay had the range, and they were busy slicing it up into packs when we walked in the door. So I was like, "Oh my goodness, I really like the red pack," and this for me felt. Christmassy and having released the panels, I, my big Merry Christmas panel, um, I was thinking of going along these lines for it, but I can't decide. So they've been sitting here and I'm thinking, well, the girls announced seasons. We've got seasons. So they're sitting to one side to the point where they sort of feel a little bit Edith Holden to me as well. So between all these flowers and the embroideries and an inspiration of England with all of these embroideries and where's my Jennifer book and the Jennifer book let me grab it because I've just had another idea I might pause the video guys okay I'm back I've got my Jennifer book so this too it just fits beautifully with this um I guess project now as I was coming back to my desk I just swung by my fabric drawer and remember I was talking about scripts music there's another thing that could be worked into your panel you might think oh why music but you might find that there's script within the music so there's definitely fabric out there I think this is a Tim Holtz fabric let me have a little look no it's a Kath Holden fabric Kath Holden's junk journals Moda so there's heaps of script there that could be used. So I think finding script or creating script on morsels for your pieces shouldn't be too hard. This one here fell out into my hand as I went as well. Who's this one? See, yeah, this is a Tim Holtz free spirit. So I think you might be surprised what you can find out there to build up backgrounds for your pieces. Now, the other thing, I was looking online at vintage tea towels and I noticed that someone had, in my area, had crocheted these little gorgeous pieces that catch a tea towel on your cupboard. And I'm thinking, look at that tea towel. So I went hunting and I found the tea towel. So this is a uh, set of two tea towels 
that um, Spotlight are selling. And for the Australian girls, they're on sale from $15 down to $10.50. Look at that. If you want flowers to fussy cut out, there is certainly some gorgeous options there. So if you didn't want to draw it, there are tea towels out there. There was a herb one as well. Maybe your garden has a beautiful herb garden and you're thinking that you might include some of the herbs into your field notes. Um, there was a herb one. So definitely worth checking out that in Australia, girls. Like, they're, they're just great. Orchids, lilies, rose, hydrangeas, gladioli, proteas, delphinians. Like, it's just, that's a pretty good combination of flowers so it might be easy to get your hands on that um, of course there's none at Harvey Bay they've all sold out but yeah you'd have to order online probably now the other book which I think will help me is the one I'm using with botanical beauties there's all sorts of flowers in here that help me build my sketches so um, I'm so pleased I've been working on botanical beauties because um, we started that in January and it's really helped me get confidence in drawing flowers. So I'm just launching straight into this where I will sketch the flower that I need according to the prompt and then go from there. Now, if it's a bird, yeah, things get tricky when it's a bird. So let me just move this all out of the way. I think you get the general gist of where the Edith Tribute Journal is going. So that's what I'm going to call it, a tribute to Edith Holden. Still not sure if they will fit in. It might be a little bit more neutral and I might not um, dip into those fabrics. But I thought I'll show them to you because they might be something you've considered and you might think, well, that's definitely my colour palette. So have a look at the new Tilda. I think it's called All the Seasons. Um, it would be out there in all of the fabric stores. So there's potential of the Tildas. It's sort of a little bit different, but I don't know, maybe morsels of it. I don't know. It'll evolve. I think the main thing is to get your basic premise. So we've got our donor book. I need to create a cover somehow out of all that. It's not going to be a concertina. Um, I think, yeah, no, it's definitely not going to be a concertina because the second journal is going to be that. Now, just while we're on sketching and additional materials, I went to my section where I um, have all my drawing and uh, books for when I was doing watercolour painting and I found this one and look at this I couldn't believe it so I thought well if I can't figure out how to do a field note journal goodness me this one is a cracker there's a few things I spotted and I thought wow that's actually very clever this top section up here have a look at this guys let me zoom in so what this person has done is she's recorded on the day that this was created. So she's numbered her entries, which I thought was a great idea. She's dated her entries. So this is really field note, classic cataloging of what you see. So I will be doing this as well. She's even worked out the longitude and latitude of her position on the planet of what she saw. So this flower, Cockadoo flat, cockatoo, cockadoo <laughs> flower. Oh my goodness, I need another coffee. Um, is at this position on the planet. I thought that was very clever. She's also created a little um, sunny, overcast, raining, um, sprinkles of rain. She's got the day, it was a Tuesday on this day, memo number two, at this location, she saw this plant. And I thought, wow. That's pretty cool. So I'll just flip through this little one. Now the book, there's the cover by Joe Brown, Secrets of Devon Wood, my nature journal. It's absolutely gorgeous. I don't know where I got it from. Oh, that's what I saw too pop up. Booktopia has gone into administration. So I know I've got a few books there on pre-order, so I'm guessing I won't be getting those. So yeah, I just thought I'd mention that to everyone because we're all hunting around for books. So 
just beware that um, Booktopia may still take an order, but they are have appointed administrators, so the Australian Booktopia, so which is such a shame. Anyway, keep moving on, Corinne. You're getting sidetracked. Look at it. Look at that. And I love how she's gone. There's a there was a bug on that leaf, and that bug is this. So layout of the journal for Edith. I think in this is just taking in that little bit more detail. So if you look at Edith's journal, she's done a similar thing. Plant names, a bit of a story, a bit of a diary entry and her flowers. Now that's spread over a full big page. So if your journal is going to be small, you can make the flower your feature and then just put a little bit of text where it was, the date. This is real field journal. And then even when you're looking at the flower, well, what is that pod? So you do a bigger version of something. You drill in and study it. It's all about studying the plant that's in front of you. That's what I'm reading for it, which is so different to what we've been doing. And it's, it's great. See, there was some bugs. I'm not a fan of bugs and then study the bug. So whether, if I was looking at this page to reproduce it and thinking about what I could do fabric-wise. So that's the challenge. We've got to take this from the drawing world into the fabric world. That's the challenge. I would make my leaves fabric. I would either stitch them or lay in strips of green fabric and then stitch them down. Then as for the bug, you could do a very small sketch and then sketch it bigger with your permanent pen uh, or straight onto fabric. Exactly what I'm doing with um, Botanical Beauty. So I sketch it first in heat erasable pen, have my little iron and like I don't like something, I iron it out, try again, try again until I find that I'm happy with it. Then I come back with a permanent black pen and sketch it in. At that point, I can decide whether I put some stitches in or some paint. So I think it's definitely going to be a combination of all of the above. Look at that. Look at that. Oh. See, my problem with the second journal, oh no, don't go into that yet. Just stay focused on one, I'll come to that. So my tribute to Edith Holding, isn't this just gorgeous book? So I feel like I've got some solid resources around me. Now, the other thing, I'm going to have a, a stab at it that the girls are going to have us drawing birds. Now, oh, it's a little daunting. So I found this one and this one. So if you're interested in investing in your skill of drawing and when the bird prompts come up, or you might want to put a bird in the background of everything, I don't know. These two are really good at helping you understand um, the concept of drawing your bird. This one in particular gets really into, you know, building your imagery. You might want a spider's web, for example, your beetle, like mastering the shape of a lady beetle and then applying color. So when we get to this section, you're adding your paints, your threads and your fabrics, but at least you can get the concept of your lady beetle. So that's a book I thought I might show you because, yeah, I think this is this is gonna help me a lot. I feel like I'm okay with plants. This is a whole nother, this is a smaller version um, of this one. This sort of includes plants as well as birds. This is just birds, a duck ducks underwater. See, Nature Journal, this would be a great sketch to have in the background of your embroidery is, yes, you've got ducks on a local pond, but what's happening under the water? So I'm sure if you were to Google image uh, sketches of ducks swimming, you would come across millions of pictures that you can refer to. So please don't think you've got to race out and buy books and things. There is so much on Google, especially if you put the word free in front of your search then you know you're not going into any copyright issues and you can literally go for it. But that would be an awesome 
sketch to have within if we get a prompt that is a bird or a specific type of bird. So, yeah, see, this is going to help me a lot. Like the axis of where feathers come from. The shape of wings to get that perspective right. It's very clever. Gosh, I spent ages looking through this book and it sat actually on the couch with me for quite some time as I kept picking it up. The angles of faces, like they get you drawing these lines and then the beak is at that point. So wherever that those two circles cross, turning of a head is the beak. So it helps you build profile on your little bird's face that makes sense. So, yeah, I'm still zoomed in. Let me just come up a little bit, guys. So, anyway, then I found these when I was going through all my journal supplies. I'm like, oh, my goodness, where did I get those? I haven't even opened them. I think I did a little project with them in, in a um, journal where I had a frame with some sellotape or not sellotape, clear plastic or something, and the little flowers were in behind and they were part of a tag. So these were there. So I thought, well, that's Edith all the way. Because I certainly don't, don't have many flowers that come from English countrysides. So that's my tribute to Edith journal. So I feel like I'm still playing with that whole gorgeous prompt that the girls have put together. So my next journal, which is another one that I'm very excited about. Let me just put my supplies there is going to be this. So if you remember at the beginning of the year, January, Susanna's prompt for the calendar series. Susanna, if uh, you don't know, is from Vintage Blend Studios. January was an ocean scene and um, Susanna had sketched out the starting image with the, the water in the distance, the, the waves breaking, and then there was this rickety fence to the side and away we went. So, having moved to the area, I just have to. I just have to. Now, I'm not sure if this will be involved in the project, but it's certainly my inspiration. The reason why I'm not sure if it can be involved is the size of my journal. I don't want to be as big as this because I want it to feel more like it's in a satchel and I've gone down to the beach and sketched something. So it needs to be smaller. So this piece is purely inspiration and to give you idea, you guys a, in, an instant understanding of where I'm heading with this. Now, the other inspiration is this. I love this journal. Oh, it's my top five books, Tilly Rose. She is in here. Now, if you don't know this book, it is definitely worth getting your hands on. Like there's just some books I think, guys, we just have to have in our stash. This is just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So I think a bit of this eclectic collaging will drift into both projects, the Edith and the Ocean. So I just wanted to have a quick flip through. Look, see, it's just... Keepsake journal, sketching. Mm. Don't be afraid to create some doodles of your designs prior to stitching. And then those little doodles find their way into your journal. So, you know, fabric and paper sit well together. Don't be think that they're two different competing um, surfaces. It works. It absolutely works. You can stitch into paper. You can attach paper. Yeah, this book goes through lots of different techniques that you can use. Look at this. Real field note feel here, guys. Oh, that's her pre preparing her journal. So if you're a beginner, this would definitely be something that I would have in my stable. Dyeing fabrics, using natural dyes, adding paint to embroidery to build up, build up depth. Mm. Like, look at that. Look at that. Isn't it beautiful? Paint, sketch, stitch. She's a clever girl. A little bird. Little bird, paint, sketch, stitch. All in pearls. 
So this definitely needs to be around. Look, using sticks that you find to create a decorative element on the side of your journal. Some great ideas here. Gosh, guys, go get this book. Look at this. Pages and fabric. So there's actual pages and then she's adding fabric and stitch to them. Just beautiful. And look, here's the Jennifer element. Little Jennifer stitches in there, little clusters of buttons, layers stitched. Beautiful. So title page, yeah, lots of inspiration. Look, creating your fabrics. This will be really handy for me with the ocean one because I don't have a lot of that washy water sort of fabric, batik fabric. It's probably a good definition of it. So this will be handy. So don't be afraid to throw some paint around, guys. Oh, just love that. Mm, okay, I think you get the general gist. It's a very quick flip through, but I just want to show you what is in this, and it is so worth the investment. Like, isn't that you're studying an area of sand dunes or something, or an embankment that has floral lines? She's painted into the background, sketched into the background, and then stitched. And uh, anyway, okay. So you can see where I'm heading with this one. Now, let's, let's talk about the accordion style journal. When I was thinking about it, I was like, well, I did an accordion style journal with my Christmas project with the Roxy Girls. So that was volume two. The blue Christmas pieces were in an accordion style piece and those pieces detached to become bunting. Um, the accordion style, I, I sort of felt like, because I'm a bit, I'm a bit heavy handed with my hands. So I felt like I was slithering around all the time on me. So I ended up putting just a few little stitches to keep my accordion in control. But my pieces detached too. So it sort of was a combination of accordion and a bunting. Does that make sense? So I was thinking about that. So then this popped into my mind. Now this was a flip-flop accordion journal that I made when I was doing um, very, very beginning of my um, YouTube channel. I did a William Morris stitchery panel and some little William Morris inspired fabric projects and this was William Morris papers. Now to kick off these journals it is an accordion style if you can see let me just come up a little bit more. So if you're thinking about, you know, doing the accordion, which 99% of us will probably do, this one here is the accordion using envelopes joined together. And then within the folds of the accordion are the locations that you put your pages. So when you then look at it, you're flipping through the journal and you get to the very back of it and then it starts again. So it's like you go round and round and round. See, it's constant. We're back at the beginning. Does that make sense? There's heaps of videos out there on the flip-flop um, journal. So my accordion journal is going to be a little bit along those lines. Now, now we're getting to making something. I, I mocked this up. I want my Seaside um, Field Notes book to be small. So I went and dug out some of the Reader's Digest books that I had. I've taken out the inners. I've picked ones that are still in reasonably good condition. With a bit of fabric through here, it should hold. I then, I've got four of them. And if you can see what I've done, so there's one with a bull clip 
holding the other one. So there's my spine. Another bull clip holding this guy with a bull clip finishing with this guy. Does that make sense? So my seasons will slide into the gaps, all right, if you were doing distinct seasons. Now, I was a little bit concerned when I was thinking about this is my concept. About a week ago, I sent uh, Rachel a message and said, I'm thinking about doing my backyard to the ocean as a journal, but I can't get the seasons right in my head. Because I'm in Queensland, we barely get winter. It's like four days in the whole year. So to switch to a season, so this is summer, um, winter, autumn and spring. Remember this book goes around in a circle. So that could be summer, autumn, winter. So we're going round, spring, um, if I got that right. Yeah, spring. When standing, I would put, if I was doing seasons, summer, I'd skip this one and go into this one with the next season, then into this one for the third season and this one into the fourth season. And then as the journal turned in my hands, I'd be back here with the first season. So it's perfect for seasons. My problem is I don't get seasons. So as I said, I sent a message to Rachel and said, I'm thinking about doing this, but I can't keep with the seasons due to Queensland. Luckily, she's an Aussie girl and she knows what I was talking about. Um, and she said, don't worry about it, go for it. So if you're in a similar climate to me where seasons are very mild and you don't get that big hit of deciduous trees, you don't get the snow, it's not England, you, we're fine. So if you can do seasons, this is a great scenario to follow your seasons, but you would need to skip the one in the middle if you want your journal to turn on the table in front of you. Does that make sense? Um, but I won't be doing that. So I'm just going to use the gaps accordingly, which is going to give me a little bit of freedom too, because there might be other things that happen in amongst the scouting for um, the prompt. And I might insert just a little morsel of something I've stitched. It might be a bit of a Jennifer stitch that I'm inspired or a little bit of a, little bit of a Tilly stitch that joins the prompt for the week. Okay. So what else did I have to show you? Colour scheme for this journal is going to follow this. This is my inspiration. I found that. I don't know. I had a brilliant plan of making socks once. And I found that. And I thought, well, that looks a little bit oceany to me. So it's going to be very uh, cream and these colours. Which brings me to, while I've got your attention, I finished my Fleur Woods piece. There she is. She is done. So I'm really, really pleased with it. Um, as you may know already, I did a Fleur Woods course in person with Fleur and she gave us a big piece of fabric. I cut it into four and did four little colour schemes and this is the first one. So the other three are packed away with all the goodies that came from the class and I can just grab it and stitch in and it's very achievable when it's so big. This little guy is 18 centimetres by 18 centimetres. So if you are considering having a play with the Fleur Woods courses or you've got the book, just a little piece is a really good way to kick off. So this is my colour palette for this journal. Um, what else did I have to tell you with it? I think that's about it. So I've got this whole um, Edith Holden. And then I've got this ocean. So it's going to be fun to drift between the colours. I have gone and dyed a heap of fabric because I want that old world look. So I just thought I'd show you that. I've got some calico ready to get that in reinforced. But I went and grabbed some bits that were really white. All of this was polar white. And I dropped it in some Parisian essence. So something a bit different. You can use tea, you can use coffee, you can eco dye. Look, I've even a bit of a scarf that was so white. This I'd cut out for the scarf that didn't happen and it was white, white, so I've dyed it. 
and then just some random laces. So I feel like my color palette has come together. That can drift between Edith and the ocean because I used those tones through here. So I feel like I've not got too much fabric difference between them all at this stage. All right, let's get ourselves a little bit tidied up here. I've got all the books to one side, my ocean. All right, so what I want to do now is have a good think about the construction of my ocean journal. The Edith one we'll get to another day. So by having these thick covers here, I think I need to thin it out a little bit. So what I'm thinking is I'm going to cut, cut here and remove one side. So that one is gone. This one stays and the fabric will join them. So I've still got a hard cover in amongst the books. So then this one stays, but that goes. And then this one comes around. So then that one goes. And this one joins here. Okay. So let's get cracking. Let's get rid of the bull clips. Now, I guess my next decision is, do I keep the spine? So let's do a little bit of chopping. And while I think, I've absolutely jiggered my fabric scissors, guys. I need to buy a new pair. There's a little something going on there. So if you're sitting there going, don't, but don't do it. I've had those for probably four years and I tried so hard. Maybe it wasn't me. Maybe someone snuck into my room and chopped something and has jiggered my scissors. I don't know. Looking for someone to blame. So that's got to go. Do I need to save the spines? How big is my stitching going to be? Thickness wise, there's only three pops. Surely it will fit. I think it would fit. So there's a spare. Will it fit? Oh, I tend to add things and I can guarantee I'll be adding shells and bits. Oh my goodness. Maybe the spines will be okay. Can I can I do it without? Just let me just think, guys. <laughs> Don't need that one. Is that one. I like the idea of using a Reader's Digest because they're readily available and it's a great size. And I sort of feel like if you're doing a field note, a little little one would be what you pop into your pocket as you head it off to do a sketch. Okay. And that one must have been stained. So does that make sense? We're thinning it out, basically. So that now needs to be attached to there. So we've got rid of the bulk. I might just put a little bull clip there so you get the general gist. This little guy is going to come in there like so. That little guy, that turn it around like that. Confusing, isn't it? Karen's probably making it more confusing than it needs to be. That's fine. Like so. So we've got our four spaces to add our seasons, if you're doing seasons. Ocean, no seasons. It's just sunshine and sand every day. Gosh, the sand in my house, it just gets everywhere. But anyway, sidetracked. One, two, three, four. And it's built on the concertina concept. Now, spines. We're going to increase our spines. Um, I don't think so. I guess because I'm not doing the seasons, I can always add more. Yeah. 
Okay, there you go. There's my get out of jail. If I find that I can only get two pieces in here because she's added shells and sticks and, oh, I can just see it coming. We can add more. Yes, we can add more. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So, we've now got to work out, let's detach that. How are we going to cover it all? Let's get rid of those. Do I want to see the brown cover? No, because it's ocean, it's not Edith, so we're definitely going to cover them. I'm thinking... I'm going to pretend the spine is not there. So I'd like to keep this, because I've never done this before with the spine sitting there. I would normally cut it off. What if it breaks down on me? I just like the rigidity of it. And instead of creating, yeah, I, we're not cutting it off. We're going to try something different. See, normally I'd slice that off. I'd cover that, cover the other one, create a new spine and reattach it all. These are in really good nick. So I'm going to try something a bit different. Let's assume... Okay, let's pretend that the fabric ends just before the spine. So I'm going to rip. And I've got four. No, don't rip that way. Let's glue it on and end it there. That's my guide. And I'd like to, we're talking about the front. So that would go there and over the side and over there. So now that's covered. I can then bring fabric that connects onto this guy when I want to join to. I can also bring fabric in here when I want to add a piece of stitching or, or cover it. So I think that's the plan. So let's get us, we've got one, we need at least two. Let's get the first two done. I don't know how long this video is. My goodness, doesn't matter. It's too much to do. We've just got to keep going. I'll have to have a think about my Edith pages and see how I can bring them together with some stability. Shouldn't be too hard. Just need some hard paper and Edith and away we go. But that's for another day. Let's get our little ocean one happening. Okay, so the plan is to... Just cover the brown. Like I said, normally this spine would be gone. You've seen me do it before, like my little um, journal that is, oh, I should not be gluing on the lemon surface. Hang on, hang on. Okay, that's better. Um, my Jennifer Clouston little botany journal that I've been working on for some time that is a Reader's Digest book and I removed the spine and created tabs another way that you could approach this project so we're just going to bring that into there I'm going to stay away from that crease that crease will be covered and dealt with when I apply the next piece of fabric we just want to push that brown back What is Pepper Peach barking at? She's getting a bit yappy. I've been working so hard on teaching her not to yap at walkers down the boundary, the side boundary of the lake and my side fence. She's so good. But now she's sneaking around to the other side of the house and um, yapping at people walking along the footpath. And it's just obnoxious. One poor fellow, he's trotting along and bloomin' Pepper come bouldering out at him. Yappy, yappy, yappy. Oh, I swear he jumped 10 foot. 
So I'm like running along behind her going, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, Pepper. I'm so sorry. And he goes, oh, that's all right. That's She's just doing a job. No, she's not. She's being obnoxious, woofing at people. Give someone a blooming heart attack. I hate it when I'm walking a dog and suddenly the dog at that property launches at the fence line and is gnashing their teeth, being an absolute bugger. So what am I doing here? We're going to glue there. So I'm just using my glue stick. It will hold. By the time this is full of fabric and stitching, and oh, I can't wait to see what it looks like at the end of this process. What an adventure. And we get to adventure, for goodness sakes. Got a bit of a surprise at the end of this video for you. I go on an adventure and show you my environment that this journal is going to be based on. It's going to be a long video. So now I'm just going to snip out some excess fabric, not needed. And because I don't want my little corner um, to be exposed of the book, I leave, there's heaps of ways you can do this, but I leave that little edge, just a little bit. And I just tuck it all down. If I was to cut it on the fold, you know, here, and remove that, I tend to find my corner of my book is exposed. And I find this is the best way for me. So now I just put a bit of glue in there, glue to glue in there, a bit there, there, and then back along there. So I'm just using economical calico muslin. I was going to do all my beautiful, um, what do they call them? Hemps and linens and antiques. And I was like, no, just that can go on it. That's where I stitch. That's my backgrounds. That can come at a later date. See that, that corner's really good. You see that one there? It's perfect. That one's not because I didn't tuck that down. And this is getting now a better. See, it's still bulk. It's still bulk in there. So get that down. I want it to sit nicely. No. Oh my goodness, I can't believe this is just not. There's too much fabric here. That's what's stopping me from turning. You've got to cut that edge. Oh, I've got glue everywhere, goodness sakes. You've got to get that tight in there. Then this can tuck in and away you go. There we go. Got it. So that's the start of it. Now, I technically let this sit overnight to really dry. The less fiddling, the better it adheres. You know, the, the usual rule that applies to all of this. But we're going to fiddle. So what I'll put at the end of this video is I'm taking you on a walk to the beach. So I've gone around down the, the road to a crossing. And that's where I started filming, where we cross in a little estuary. Um, and I walk through the uh, sand dune zone and then up onto the top of the sand dune, down onto the beach. And then I just give you a bit of a geographical information of where exactly I am. So you can have a look at Google Maps and sort of see the places that I mention. And then on my way back to home, along the footpath, I come back to our property and I walk the side boundary next to us in the lake. I walk on the outside of my fence line along there um, and then do a, a lap to the side of the lake. I've done it once before, ages ago, when we were still building. And I get to uh, where the estuary feeds from the ocean into the saltwater lake. So there's all sorts of things that we spot on the way that I'm presuming may be part of our prompts 
and potentially be, you know, inspiration for me. So, yeah, that's coming at the end of this video. Having said that, Seasons comment that I just don't have seasons to follow along with as strictly as some of you may, being where I live. I will be able to explore seasons a bit with the Edith one, of course. Um, <clears throat> but it'll be all in my imagination. The This morning I hopped up and I'll insert the picture at the end. Pepper, bless her, cotton socks, all banded with, I technically don't know who, I'm going to assume it's Pepper. She has removed the cushion from her bed, taken it out on the lawn through the night and munched it up, opened it up. There is white fluff everywhere. So that was what greeted me this morning. So I've taken a photo of it. You can see the devastation of the said bed. And then the other thing she did is... I picked up some more plants from my garden and I looked into her bed and this was the day before the pillow incident. There's a plant pot in a bed with a plant in it that she's picked up and has taken to bed. So she's decorating her accommodation. Those of you who are in the little Facebook group that Susanna and I have, I've already posted the pictures in there. So you've probably already seen the shenanigans. But um, I'll pop that at the end of the video too so you can see what I'm dealing with. So there you go, Barham Heads does get snow if Pepper's involved. Little minx. She's getting the blame for it anyway. Bandit may have done it, but being that she's got form... She's the one getting the blame. Anything that doesn't adhere when you come back to your cover, you just add a little extra glue. Okay, so we've worked out how to cover the end book. <clears throat> so that's the ends. <clears throat> And now there's another end there. And this one will be pretty straightforward. Let's get some more fabric. Oh, because covering the whole thing. This video is going to be so long, probably. We'll see. Oh, don't. We've got to turn it. That was nearly crucial. <coughs> So I'll do that as my homework to get the general gist of those pieces. But we've got this one that is full. So I need a piece for him. I bet I have not torn this out as efficiently as I could have. So this one, because it's the full book, it will capture the spine. And as for the spines, they will just be, so let's pretend, I'm going to be here all day if I don't get a wiggle on. Let's pretend that this one gets covered in the same manner. Get rid of that. So, now we'll just do it. We've got all day, don't we? Lots of glue. There's a few little tricks I'll show you with this because you've got to get that fabric down into that crease. Otherwise, your book won't close properly. It does take a little extra thought. So you need a ruler. You need to make sure you get glue down into there. I love these 
glue sticks because they're blue and I can see where I've been. So that way I get a really nice liberal coating. They dry clear and strong. It's inexpensive. They're about $2 each. I get them from Officeworks. I think I've seen them at Woolworths as well. And at the beginnings of the year when all the kids are going to school and those poor parents are having to buy supplies for school, they're often in a really good deal. You might get five or six in a set. So I often grab a few sets then. Okay, I think I got it blue. <clears throat> So, I'm going to flip it. Oh, come on, don't, don't muck around. I cook it, but that's okay. Where's my. I need to protect my mat. I really should be doing this on a hard surface. <coughs> Okay, so now I need to make sure that that fabric is going into there. So I grab a ruler <clears throat> and just gently manipulate the fibres of the fabric to go in. And I know that it's going to turn really well. <clears throat> it won't crease. As long as I don't close it, you've got to leave it flat. Flip it back over. And then when it dries, everything is going to work nicely. Okay, so let's do... I haven't um, covered a book like this for ages because I usually cut the spine out and away that goes. <clears throat> but I thought, no, let's do, let's do it as if we're not... You know, with a Reader's Digest spine, I think will be a pretty good size. Because there's not a lot of stitcheries. There's only three per season. So I don't need a big spine. And because it's concertina, we can just add as we go. So same principle as before. Down into those grooves. Trying to speed it up a little bit now. <clears throat> so I'll come back through with fabrics for here as well. Cut to size. I'll line some fabric through here. There's heaps of videos out there on how to, you know, create a journal and cover with fabric so you might have your own technique this will at least give you a bit of an idea of where I'm heading with it get that tucked down in there smoosh some more glue stick um, did I mention you can use PVA glue as well? Just smear it around with your fingers. You just don't want it too lumpy because it will soak through your fabric, especially if you're using some beautiful lace or something to cover your book or a printed, printed fabric. <clears throat> I was tempted to use that to cover my book, but it's very dark and moody. I don't know. I like the print, but sort of didn't... Um, I'm talking about the Edith book now. This one's going to have its own theme, of course, which I'm yet to create. But I figured if we can just get a neutral base, we can go anywhere then. Okay. Gosh, when I start thinking about the environment and what I see, you know, from shells to 
things that roll up on the beach and the plants in the sand dunes and yeah those of us that are near the water like that <clears throat> behind my property to the west I have a freshwater lake too and I know there's um, swans over there they often come and land in the saltwater lake of a morning and they'll do a bit of a hot lap of the lake they'll go from the houses across to me and then squawk and carry on at all the saltwater birds seabirds and then they leave and it's like they come over and cause a bit of a ruckus and then they're gone it's usually only two at a time, just a couple. There must be a bit of teenagers in the group. And then when you walk back through the bush um, and you come across that lake, there's probably about four or five in there. There might be more. That's what I've <clears throat> observed. So that gives me an opportunity for birds to maybe even do a swan. Which would be interesting. and glue everywhere guys oh my goodness we're getting there see all of those little bits sticking up I can come back through with the glue just tidy up threads oh my goodness we, we're on the hour and I know I was rabbiting on prior to turning <laughs> the video off to get the Jennifer book all right so we're going to assume that that one's covered, but we've at least got two. So now <clears throat> I've got to join those. So there'll be fabric used for that. Where's my fabric? I could do some stitch pieces in there as well, but I might just use this for now. Then I know it's secure. Let it all dry. And then if I decide to put more fabric through that has been embroidered I can just go straight over the top again with it I'm sure this will evolve so the plan is to glue that first onto there we're going to reconnect it so we've essentially just thinned it out a little bit to get rid of the bulk probably should be waiting for that to dry too What's Pepper barking at? She's going to get some discipline today. We're going to spend a bit of time in the front yard. I'm going to wait for some walkers. And I'm going to be right there on her tail. Or is that too big? Of course it is. What am I doing here? Let's break that down. So if you're doing a Reader's Digest, this piece is about four and a half inches. Because we want it to go over there to connect and then we want it let's just double check no, we do it like that so do we do it like that or do we do it like that we're going to do it like that so do you see that so this book has turned <clears throat> around. Probably doesn't matter because we can come back the other side with fabric as well. As we join all these elements together. So that little guy is just going to nestle in there. Line it all up. And we're reattaching. Now just carefully turn it over because it hasn't dried and just double check that that's all straight. We've still got our indent which helps the book to move. Then my next lot of fabric, if this was bigger, would go there. So now we're joined. Where's some fabric? <clears throat> I think you get the general gist. We'll be here all day if I carry on any longer. Getting a bit worried that it's taking too long. 
because you've still got to go for a walk with me to the beach. It's all good. We're all busy doing this, so I'd rather we get it done and we're ready to move on to the title page. So I, I'm going to have to be very careful I don't wriggle all this too much because I'm really jumping ahead here in the efforts to show you my thinking and my process. And I'm risking it all coming apart because I haven't allowed each stage to dry thoroughly. And we've got a very cold, windy day here. So it's going to take a little longer to dry. So that will go through there. So we've now connected that single cover with that guy. You can see how it's going to be easy to add on to the covers if my prompts get out of hand and I need more space. Down into the grooves, use my fingers or your ruler. Okay, let's gently stand this up. Okay, so there is my new cover. So you get the general gist. So this guy will attach here with then another piece of fabric there another piece of fabric there and I just keep going so I've thinned out my concertina of covers basically by getting rid of that excess and then recovering it all together I need to go back with glue and yeah and then all of my work will sit within the gaps if you're doing seasons I reckon you would skip a gap and then as your book as you work through your book, as you flip through your book, it'll flip over in your hands and you're on your way again back through the book. But you're actually coming down the other side. Hope that all makes sense. If you want to go and visit some flip-flop journals, just put it into the search engine of um, um, YouTube. And there's heaps of them out there in the paper world. Okay. I think that's all I wanted to show you guys. I will, for my homework, finish this. I'll get this little guy attached as well. So, yeah, I think, I think I've think i covered everything I wanted to cover. Okay, I'm going to go and wash my hands. I'm going to toddle off, finish this, have a bit of a think about the cover for the Edith Holden book. That'll be my next project when I come back to you. And then we can start thinking about title pages. But at the moment, that's where I'm at. I will now insert a walk to the beach. It's another 20 minutes. My goodness, this video is going to take forever to upload. I better stop yapping. All right, guys, I'll say goodbye. And straight away, you'll be on your way to the beach with me to have a look at the inspiration for this journal. All right, guys, look after yourselves. Bye. Okay guys, I've just arrived at a little estuary that runs along the uh, coastline where I live. We go through here over a couple sand dunes and we're at the ocean. So I thought I'd film this little track in. Directly behind me are residential houses, not ours. We're sort of one street back a little bit with a lake between us and the people behind me. So I'm just coming through here. This is a tidal estuary that actually forks and feeds my lake but this direction it um, sort of peters out at another crossing like what I'm on um, this direction so looking south it forks way back down there probably about 2k away it forks one goes off towards my lake and the other one flushes up in here so high and low tide very much affected it's a low tide at the moment so I can see to the bottom here of this little estuary. So let's carry on. We've crossed the little bridge. And now we're in, they call this Wallum country. So full of eucalypts and, you know, tree, native Australians that love uh, growing in sand. 
So pretty rough country to grow in. The people have collected shells and dropped them around trees. They were doing a lot of that and then the council came along and said, hey guys, stop taking shells from the beach and depositing them around these trees. So a lot of that stopped. That, that was probably about five years ago. So the council weren't happy. Some of the residents were hanging shells on ropes through these trees too and it just didn't look real good. So this is natural. And the council said, stop mucking around. There's still a few shells sort of lying around. A lot of that's kids now. They'll bring shells back from their walks. And mum probably doesn't want that in their house. There's a little area coming up here. Looks like someone can have a little rest if they're, you know, a little bit out of breath. And there's a bench seat there, which seems to be accumulating shells. Oh, there's a pair of socks. All rubbish which shouldn't be there so now we're coming up towards the beach I just don't want to talk too loud because there might be someone nearby but I doubt it. it's pretty quiet our area so low tide so the tide goes out for probably a kilometer I don't know if you can see in the distance probably can't there's a human out there with a puppy dog playing ball long way out in the very distance where my finger is pointing that's the tip of um, um, Meribara Point de Vernon so if I come a little bit down for those Australians wondering where I am so I'm at Barham Heads and if I'm looking south it curves around to Tugan, Craignish, Dundaran right around to roughly there, Point Vernon. Then it curves again, and that's Harvey Bay. So that's sort of, it's two big curves with Point Vernon. In the very distance, I'll try and zoom in, but I don't think we're gonna see it. Okay, we can. So Point, oops, let's get my pointer in camera. Where are, where's my finger? There. So Point Vernon is at the end of my fingernail. Let it focus there. See in the distance part, there's a dog running. See in the distance, there's another line of land out there and then it just stops about middles of the screen. That's the tip of Fraser Island. So Fraser Island is closest at Tin Can Bay Rainbow Beach, which is about two hours south of me. And then the island sort of hook turns out towards the ocean. So we're the furthest distance from Fraser Island. You can just see it in the distance there. I'll try and zoom in a little bit more. So that's the very tip of Fraser. And then as I pan around, you'll see it go darker. That's the tip of Point Vernon and Harvey Bay is nestled in behind that dark mass. That's the township of um, Harvey Bay peeking over the ridge there. Eli Waters, there's mountains in the distance, and then, which would probably be Meribara. Then as it bends around the coastline back to where I am in a big hook, um, those other little satellite towns, little cottage towns are on the way back to me at Barham Heads. Now, if I pan to the north, we have some land again. That's the mouth of the Barham River. So the mouth is there so that's all river and it disappears around the corner if I walked probably 2k up the beach I'd then get to the mouth on this side of that same river Barham River and that's where our township actually is the caravan parks the fish and chip shop bakery things like that so at low tide she gets low been meaning to show you all this for some time like look how far that doggy is out there where is he? Give him a camera. See him walking there? He's chasing a ball. We've been out there with my dad's dog years ago. We went for a walk way out and you walk back with the tide. It's quite interesting to see all the life out there. Well, we actually saw a shark fin out in the deeper water where it gets a little bit bluer. That was a bit scary. We're like, come on, honey, let's go. <laughs> There's a shark following us along the coastline. It probably wasn't, but you know the dramatic effect so let me zoom back we've got a pretty good beach if I do say so myself 
And look at the humans on the beach. There's one with a dog. There was a couple who are now probably a K away in the distance. There's many points back into our area, but roughly where those trees are there, that's the end of our area. Then there's a lot of bush, some old farms, and then you hit the mouth of the river and the township of Barham Heads. So this is my beach. Let's go down to the water's edge. It's a good day for this because usually it's a bit windy and um, it messes with the microphone on the phone. So I'm sort of battling, yeah, battling the uh, elements. I might just get to about, well, you can see on the sand, high tide. So we get a little bit of sand, probably about 30 metres. Then it really goes out, way out. That doggy out there is having a great time. Now for walking, I can walk right down to about there and I'm at the township of um, Tugum. And on the way, there's a clump of trees. So I'm just zooming in. See that clump of trees there? in the foreground that's a little creek sneaking out see the dead trees on the embankment there that is a little estuary there's a human there actually in the middle of that um, an estuary comes out which you can cross at low tide and walk to the township of Tugum and there's a great cafe there you can have a coffee and then turn around and walk back up to where I am that's probably about five kilometers so it's a nice gentle walk if you're so inclined so it's beautiful down there that estuary is quite uh, deep and beautiful real blue so let me zoom back out and if you want to walk to Barham the mouth of the river it's probably about 10k that way I'm just guessing but that's about it so there's our foreshore gosh years ago some of these big old trees used to be really thick but then see how they're dying off and they fall over and new little trees come up it's constantly changing it's still quite dense down there but there's been some big storms over the years and some of these trees which were once growing and thriving have pretty much fallen over now there's another interesting thing let me just come back here i don't know if i'll pick it up just off the tree line is a black stump where's my finger again there right oh it's wobbly okay so where my finger was so that tree used to be where the beach was so that's how much has eroded away in the last 30 odd years because that used to be a farm and his cattle would come right to the water it's since been all purchased by national parks and things like that see the two humans there on the beach oh they're having a cuddle oh how sweet that was a little little moment there um that tree used to be pretty much where all those trees are so that's how much it's really washed away you get a few storms in a row the sand just disappears so the mouth of the river was there as i just said that point which is there if I was to go round that point, I'd be on my way to Bundaberg for the Aussies watching. And on the other side of the river, looking back at our township, is uh, Woodgate, which is another little place with a, a pub, a bowls club, you know, all of those things. So let me just zoom back out, because remember that's about probably 10K away. And there's my entry point back to civilization so it's just beautiful what a beautiful day oh my goodness oh my goodness i will film high tide from the same spot and attach it to this video so you can see both environments oh, there's doggy and human are now out there and there's a boat way way out it's not a pirate ship it looks like a fishing boat. There's an artificial reef basically out there off the top of Fraser where they they sunk a naval vessel that was put into retirement. So there's tours go out there with scuba divers that now dive that artificial 
wreck, uh, reef, reef built on a wreck from out of Harvey Bay. It's become a bit of a touristy thing. And fishermen um, put their boats in at Burham Heads and go straight out that way because you're in the open ocean and they catch all sorts of amazing fish out there really deep, 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 deep. But most of the tours and touristy things to Fraser Island and uh, Gari is the new name for Fraser is, um, yeah, all out of Harvey Bay. So it's very interesting. All right, well, I might say goodbye for now. There'll be a few little videos I'll attach in here. I'm um, just not sure if this is the first one and the rest follow or you've already seen something. Anyway, I'm going to head back through the bush and film a few other little details about where I live. Okay, guys. Bye. Okay, guys, I'm back. So I'm just heading back to our house, which is just there. And this is the start of the lake. So there's a house opposite us, but the lake meets the footpath. So often fishermen will come down and fish off this little bankment. So I'll just give you some bearings. What I'm going to do is walk towards our property. Then I'm going to go along the side fence of our place and do a hook turn over there and walk up that side. So that's sort of coming up the far side. In the distance over there is National Park. So here's the start of our beachy sort of bench, or not bench, bankment to the lake. I'll just pan around. You can see suburbia just here. That's a freshwater lake through there that feeds under the road when it gets to a certain level into the saltwater lake. So I'm just now heading across to my property. You'll probably see Pepper and Bandit on the way. I'm sure they'll hear my voice and go, oh, what are you doing out there, Mum? So I'm now at the edge of our boundary. And I had some spare grass, so I threw it in over here. So I've got a bit of track to walk. But there's our lake. Now the ocean where I just was is on the other side of those houses. So I've sort of now, I guess, taking you for a lap around the lake so I'm coming down the side of our property where's my hounds nope they're probably over the other side and don't realize that I'm coming so while I'm here actually I'll show you I've planted in here a heap of Australian natives to help shore up the embankment all bird loving oh he doesn't look real good sort of a bit of a hit and miss will they survive see that's a grevillea and he's looking a bit sad but that grevillea is flowering and we've seen birds coming to it and feeding see the flower but this little guy yeah he's not happy yeah hmm might lose him but it, he's one of mine he's one of mine and then they get lower and more shrubby here. That's one of mine. That guy. This little guy's happy. Little little red flowers. This guy's really happy. Look, look at that. Isn't that amazing? Some do, some don't. That had a big flower on it. This has since come out. Look at all the buds. If I'm gonna do any replacement planting, that's the one. I kept all the tags. There's a little one of mine there. This little guy, the little red flowers. Woolly bush. He should definitely survive. He's classic. Some more grevilleas. That little guy there. And there. And that's as far as I went because I didn't want to block out my view. But there's also, look at this little fellow. He's a native. I didn't plant him. He's pretty cute. And there's a, a big cousin of his. Got to do some research, find out what these things are all called. There's another little one down there. All right, stay focused. Let's get back up on the embankment. So, all right, let's keep trotting along. There's another little cluster of my plants in here. I think once I get a little bit of this mulch happening, as I 
mow the grass I put my clippings here I think that'll help build a bit of life into this sand dune so it'll all happen another little one of mine there there oh he's happy oh that's an eremophila look at that he's really happy so I could replace with eremophila by the looks of it another grevillea um, and we come around here and there were two here oh he's happy throwing flowers and he's happy interesting all right back up so there's the lake which i'm sure if you've been with me for a while you've seen videos made of this area so what i'm doing now is i've come back down to the water's edge and i'm just going to make my way to the corner so in the back here behind my property that's all national park or a little bit belongs to the developer but then the boundary of the national park kicks in where I'm heading right there there's some big boulders that have been put there to stop people driving their four-wheel drives years ago people would come in here and do donuts and burn rubber around making a hang of a mess so the council put in some rocks to stop them. It was funny because the buggers then would drive up there and find a new path. So there's rocks back there. They put more here, the chain, so their men can get in. There's scientists that come and study everything. There's like little markers. So it's obviously an area that they're watching closely and protecting and studying. So now I'm officially in National Park. There's a plant over here that's caught my eye. I wouldn't mind that growing on my embankment. Look at this guy. What a beautiful flower. I think I've got a version of him in my garden, but his leaves aren't as thick as this. Unless he's more mature, and that's why it looks thick. Right, look at the size of that. Very robust. Mm. I don't think I can take plants from the National Park, so I might... Uh, I forget about that idea. Look at it growing here. It's beautiful, very healthy. See, this is what you get when people are restricted a little. Just walk with your footprints. Oh, look at all the growth on that. What do they call that? Lichen. It's all over that. How gorgeous. Ooh. See when you stop and look? So I'm just panning back. So there's my house there. I come along that edge on that road and I've cut through, done a U-turn and now I'm heading back up. So let's go for a little walk. Take you on a stroll. Beautiful, beautiful day. I'm sorry the camera's bouncing around but I need one of those GoPros if I'm going to film, you know, when they put them on motorbikes and walking adventures and that stabilises it itself. I'm just using my iPhone, so Bodgy Brothers here. So this here had a really high tide. You can see that growth there, that fills up with water because the little estuary is just behind those trees and that breaks the bank there when we get a three metre plus tide which usually only happens around the full moon. And sometimes when it flushes through here, it's so beautiful to watch, only lasts about 40 minutes and it's gone. There might be the odd stranded fish. So you see all the big seabirds come in, the eagles and the hawks looking for a morsel. The dingoes all coming down to see what poor soul got stranded on the sand. Poor fish. So we're making our way up to the very end the lake's beautiful just beautiful it's so pretty when it's still because these houses across from me um, throw their reflection into the water it's so pretty so just standing here the, the one there on the end that was our original property which we sold to build the one we're in then there's two neighbors and then there's a vacant block of land there just there that's where my mate and her husband, Mary Ann, is going to build their house. It's all very exciting. Ooh, I wonder what that is. 
human. I'm thinking big, big reptile, like, you know, dinosaur. But no, it's a human. Human with a stick. Here's this human with a stick. Flicking their stick. Maybe it was a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Dinosaur dragging his left leg. Some more of that pretty flower. So when I get up here, there will be an estuary feeding in. Remember in the video just before I said that it forks? This is the tip of the other fork. Does that make sense? Probably not. Google. Google, Google Earth, Barham Heads. You'll probably be able to peg exactly where I am and look at the terrain and you'll understand the, the creek system that's here from the ocean. So, oh look, someone's put a lump of timber here. They must be using it to sit on to fish. Oh my goodness, why do humans do that? Why do they move into these areas and, you know, change things? Oh my goodness. Yeah, okay. So, this is the little inlet that feeds my lake. The house is just there that we built. Now, this inlet, when we built, the water came through there. Over the years, it's actually split and created this little island. Very interesting. It's a bit of a bird rookery here too. Of the morning, you see lots of white birds sitting here looking for fish coming in. They get a bit of a vantage point. You'd see a fish very easily from there. So let's just walk this way where this little estuary or feeder has split to make a little island. When we were holidaying here, oh, for years we just had the block and we'd just camp. And then uh, we eventually built, we had it for like 11 years. I'd sit in here, it was a lovely spot to cool off. So coming along here, it gets very shallow. It's only about to my ankles deep. It's a bit deeper there. But then it gets really, really shallow again. And it sort of drizzles across this little bit of sandy area, which allows us to actually cross and get to the other side, which then, so you could cross through here. You can then walk through that bush and you'd be at the beach again. So when I was in that house, that's how I would go to the river, other the ocean. But now that I don't own that property, I use the footpath and there's a little gap in amongst those houses to the water. So that's what I use now. So if you look through here, can you see the water just in behind those trees? That's the estuary coming into this region. And it has forked in that distance to come up along behind all of those dunes where I was crossing the bridge. So let me just move back. So we're in National Park. There's our place in the distance. And we've just walked along that edge. I'm just gonna take you over here, guys, because there's something really interesting. You know how when you watch those nature, look at all the kangaroo tracks here. Look at that. That's why I'm heading over here. You know when you watch those nature videos and they have trails, animal trails? Look at all the action from the roos. They come through morning and night and they make their way through here. They cross the estuary and then they sit over here on that grass in the west, getting that warm afternoon sun before it sets. And those people over there have big pots of water out. So when it's dry season, there's a lot of roos come in there to um, get a drink of water. So this is a corridor, is what I'm leading to. So from over at my place, well, originally I could sit on the balcony there and see this thoroughfare of wildlife. And I'm talking dingoes, kangaroos, foxes, anything that's moving across the land. So just to bring it back out a bit, there's my house. So I'm sort of walking back towards a bit away from it a little bit. This was the clump of trees that you could see. In behind here is the track. 
this clump of trees is like a bit of a thoroughfare. In through there and in around there is where all these creatures move through. So I can be sitting on my patio. I'm just going to go around it a little bit. I can be sitting on my patio and I'll see animals make their way into this little um, oh, look, doggies. I'm looking at poops at the moment, whether they're dingoes or kangaroos or human dogs, I don't know. This is like their little, if we get there guys, we will be safe and then we can make a run for it to the next safe spot. So, let me just get around here. So remember when I said if a, a tide is three metres, well really 3.2. 3.2 and more, this fills up with water only about just below my ankle, real shallow. So it pretty much breaks its banks back in there and it oozes into here. And then it's like someone pulls the plug and it's all gone. It's definitely changing. 11 years ago, there wasn't as much grassy like this area here doesn't go underwater now where it used to so things have changed like any big storm tidal flushes i guess deposit more soil or on embankments that are already there okay now i'm on the other side of this little tree area so the estuary forks again and comes up through the back here so the animals come out of that scrub that runs behind me and further back for kilometres. They appear at this little opening. They scoot across here and they're in here for safety. And then they'll hang there for a little bit and then they'll scoot across to where I used to live. It's very interesting. So that estuary that has forked, forks again. And that water comes up through this little mangrove there's a, like a little channel of water then it opens up to a massive sand dune area i'll lift my phone i don't know if i can get enough height nah can't so the water sneaks up here a little bit and then it peters out and sort of a bit swampy and then flushes every so often with high tide but predominantly all the water comes from that region up to my lake up to the estuary that we walked over the bridge and a little bit up here and if we zoom in see all that white sand behind those mangroves oh you can see the little channel it's only about a foot deep in behind there is just big acres and acres of sand so that's all part of this bird sanctuary that we've uh, now got on the edge of us which is just beautiful so let's walk back towards the lake so this is my new environment like i've been here a while if you take into account 11 odd years of the uh, block of land slowly built a house and then it took us three years to plan and build the next place due to the COVID issues that were out there on the planet and we're finally now here permanently so I'm just walking back to the lake I've got that sign in my sights that the National Park has put in place just making my way so different like I'm a farm kid so I know that environment pastures farms rocks you know all of the above creek systems dams the whole world then I was in Brisbane for 30 years so I got to know the big city and now I feel like I've landed on Mars again so Brisbane was like Mars now now this is like Mars here's our sign 
everything in this park is protected under the Conservation Act. There you go. So it's all protected. So let's make our way back to the water's edge. What's that saying? We should only leave our footprints behind. That's a good one. Alright. So I'm back at the water. Beautiful. Alright guys, I'm going to say goodbye now. Giving you a bit of a whirlwind tour of my new environment. I've got the ocean, I've got estuaries, I've got sandy flats, I've got a freshwater lake, I've got a saltwater lake. This one's the saltwater one, the freshwater ones are sort of in the distance and further down the street. But um, yeah, lots of different things to explore. Welcome to my world. Alright guys, talk soon.